This life-changing message has been brought to you by Shake the Nation's Ministries. You're now listening to Tell the Devil You're About to Make a Comeback. The title of my message this morning is Tell the Devil You're About to Make a Comeback. Tell the devil, tell all of hell, you're about to make a comeback. My God. Woo. I'm a young minister, I'm a young preacher, I'm not even wet under the ears. I don't know everything, I don't know hardly much. The, the one thing I do know is the gospel. For that's what I encountered. I was on my own in a room. My mom and dad had prayed for years. The Bay Revival and Crusades and even being a preacher was not even in my mind. And yet in a room on my own, the power and presence of God, I, I had addictions in my life. I was bound. I, I was living out of wedlock. I, I, I was just so far from God and you know my testimony of how God by his presence and by his power so heavily came upon me that it felt like someone had stuck an electric cable in my shoe. I began to tremble and I just fell into the floor. People say, well, I'm not sure about that. That don't matter to me. What, you think I want to impress you? You think I need to prove to you that's what happened to me? My God, if God can shake mountains, you better know he can shake you. And when he does, all that you think you know will shake with it. In fact, I can, can I be bold to say this morning, some of you need a shaking. Wakey, wakey, it's time to go. There are times in our lives where we need God to shake us. That's what revival really comes to do. People wonder why when the power of God breaks out, why, well, all this stuff's happening. I'm under attack. This is happening. This is happening. You better know that when you mess with darkness, when that light begins to shine, all the cockroaches start to come out. There are young people here this morning, you grow up in church all your life. You come because mommy and daddy want you to come. But already in your mind, you've left home. Already in your heart, you're ready to walk out the door and never come back. I've been there. I sat on the back rows. I know how you feel like somehow if this is it, I want out. But I'm telling you right now, you better know that you got a mommy and daddy that have been praying for you, son. You better know that God is going to come to a place with you that even if he has to shake you, shake you, he will in order to save your soul. One of the greatest things for me is that when God takes hold of a life, he doesn't just put you in a pew. He puts destiny inside of you. One of the greatest tragedies that I see in the church today is that people don't understand about inheritance. When Christ shed his blood, he didn't just shed it for salvation. He shed it for an inheritance. And I'm not talking about money. I'm not talking about cars. I'm not talking about houses. I'm talking about an authority that comes from Christ to rebuke the devourer. One of the greatest revelations in my life was when I was in, stood in a field in Africa and, and literally they were carrying out tens of tens of people demon-possessed. 
trembling, frothing at the mouth, bound by witchcraft, bound by strongholds. I'm talking about 10 year old children, three grown men trying to hold them down. Oh, I know you say it doesn't happen in America, but you'd be wrong. It's just hidden. We've had witches coming in here while you were dancing and praising God, stood right there trying to curse us. That devil never learns. But I remember the night that the Spirit of God said to me, just speak my name. And as I stood there, I closed my eyes and I said, Jesus. Some of you wonder why I shout Jesus in the revival. Jesus. Why? When you speak his name, even the atmosphere must pay attention. Those devils began to squeal. Some of them were trying to run out of the field. I'm telling you right now, I suddenly realized that there's an inheritance that comes by the blood of the Lamb and the power of the Holy Ghost that we must learn we have. This is not about being a big preacher. This is about being a child of God. An inheritance. And yet we find today that people are not built for war. We're not equipped for it. People start complaining, oh, I'm under attack. My cable's been cut off for two weeks. My God, you're suffering. We're downcast because the car broke down. Big deal. We got to be built for war. Ready for no matter what. We're going to go after God. We're going to take dominion of that which the devil thinks he'll never have to let go. We got to have a tenacity and in a fortitude. Oh, I'm preaching already. But I believe there's something in this generation. There's something coming upon the church. And if it ever should come upon a church, it should become upon a church that has watched people get out of wheelchairs and cancers and blind eyes and deaf ears and young people getting right with God for the last two years. If ever we should be ready, it should be now. Should be now. But many times we're not prepared. And when circumstances don't go the way we think they should, we are finding a desert place where we give up. You see, you can still come to church. You can still sing songs. You can still shout hallelujah, but giving up inside. The thing you were fighting for, you don't fight for it anymore. You've learned to live with a limp. People can be in the presence of revival. You don't think I don't see you? Night after night when this place has been packed to the back hall. But I see a face that's there every week. And while those that have been touched, I see it in their face and in their eyes. They gave up years ago. Their eyes no longer burn with that fire. The greatest obstacle to God is not the devil. It ain't every heart of hell. One of the greatest obstacles to the Spirit of God is when you stop believing. 
But I was up while the early hours because the Lord said to me, you're going to preach this morning. You're going to preach from the depths of your spirit. Tell the devil and tell hell you're about to make a comeback. What was dead is about to come alive. My God, I'm going to preach this until I got nothing left. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 30, you will read. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalek, Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire. They had taken captive the women and those who, who were there so small and great. They did not kill anyone but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city and there it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. My God, my God, my God. Verse 8, so David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, pursue, for you shall surely overtake. You shall surely overtake. And without fail, you will recover all. Spirit of God, let your power, let the anointing that breaks the yoke fall on every head. I call those that are sleeping to waken. I call those that are in bondage, under attack, or weary, or tired. I call them in the name of Jesus that they will be strengthened with might in the Holy Ghost. And the people of God shouted, Amen. Isn't it funny? That when you go to God many times over present trouble, He will always talk to you about your future. Have you ever found with God that you go saying, God, don't you know there's present trouble right now? It's going to take me out. And yet God speaks to you about your tomorrow. You see, we preach the gospel for years. I'm not attacking America. I feel like I'm one of you. But you preached the gospel for too many years. That told everybody that everything was going to be okay. That you would never have to face trial. Just come and get your hands laid on you. Let have a jolt down your spine and you're going to be okay. So then we have people in the pews that when things go wrong, they don't tell anyone because they feel like they're unspiritual. Oh, I'm going to preach to you this morning. So even in the midst of where people are being healed, people are being set free, the glory of God's coming, you feel that anointing, but your life is not reflecting what is happening in the service. You don't have a million dollars. You don't live in a mansion. You don't wake up every day. Woo! Glory! But the reality is that those that truly find Christ, those that really do things for God, and I would advise you, I'm only a young man, and I'm not telling you older ones anything. I'm just trying to speak out of the spirit of what God has put inside of me. But I'm telling you, get around people that are doing something for God. They'll teach you something. I can't stand being around people that just tell you how to have revival. They've never had it in their lives. I get emails every week from them. What I really want to do is pick them up. I'll pay for their air ticket. I'm going to fly them over to a field in Africa. Stick them in there. I'll see you in an hour. And watch when they do when we get back. My God, help me. The truth of God's word 
the truth and foundation is that we will face adversity. We will face times of trouble. But God, if you will allow him, shall be with you through any trial or test, even unto the valley of the shadow of death. I love preaching about David. I feel the Holy Ghost this morning. Those of you that are watching online, get ready. Woo! I love it when God gives me a word because it's like a fire in my bones. Somebody's going to get set free this morning. Somebody is going to get set free this morning. In Jesus' name. What I love about David was that he was a man that arrived in his destiny against all odds. What I love about him is that he wasn't the favored one. He was the eighth son. The brothers didn't know him. And many times people can walk past you just because you're in a trial or a test. Or, and they don't recognize who you are. They don't have to. Stop trying to prove to people who you are in God. He knows who you are. What I love is, in a place of insignificance, God was training him how to take the armies of hell. Don't ever, ever underestimate when God has you in a place that you think is insignificant. You see, most of the time you will learn in your walk with God, it's not about the destination. It's what you learn along the way. Now that is good preaching. I'm preaching to myself this morning. I remember when I used to ask God for miracles in my ministry. I prayed for many that were never healed. But it's what I learned along the way. Because when I actually saw people get out of wheelchairs and blind eyes open, that wasn't what it was about anymore. It's what God took me through. The process in order to equip me that I might be ready for what he had me to do. Oh, I wish somebody would shout amen. amen. I love in revival when you give altar calls and you say to people, who wants to be used by God? Who wants to shake a nation for God? My Lord, that altar... You feel the steam coming off their shoes. It's awesome. I'm the same. That's not a desire of man. Only God can give you that desire. Only God can give you a dream. Only God can open your heart to the things that he has for you. But always know when you're in those lines for those prophecies. <laughs> You'll notice that when a prophet's in the house, I just stay well back. Because I've learned. When you get that word, when that word comes and you're shaking under the anointing, you better get ready. Because you just put a big dot right in your head. Devil, come get me. The second God anointed David to be king. Even those that he served wanted to take his head off. <laughs> when you want to do something for God, young people, all the ones too, prepare your life, prepare your family, prepare those around you that you have just opened your life up. Because while ever you're not bothering the devil, he will not bother you. The second he sees destiny on you, you're a prime target. The second you have a dream, that dream must die. Only
only those that are filled with the fire of God when they feel the attack like Joseph the Bible says yet he dreamed another dream I'm past the introduction Saul is trying to kill him he's an outcast he's in a desert place he's supposed to be king but he's out where no one can see him he must have been many nights that he thought why does Saul want to take my head off the Bible says that he comes to a place with his wives and the fighting men that he arrives at a place called Ziklag an insignificant place a desert place that was actually at the dominion of the Philistines I want you to picture for a moment they set up camp for one year and four months the wives the children David is going out to battle footnote sometimes I know people could get their nose bent out of shape because somebody didn't give them the place that they thought they ought to have had and now they're all disgruntled they're not even in the revival because somebody didn't give them a place watch David David is fighting the Philistines even though they were the enemies of Saul and not him and yet he loves God's people so much that he was willing to fight but just from a different perspective See, sometimes God is watching you. God is watching how you live your life. He's watching. When you don't get that position, when you don't get that acclamation, when people don't recognize you, are you still fighting for the cause? You know, sometimes I'm an evangelist. But sometimes I need to preach to the church because I'm telling you without the army in place we get defeated every time. Are you hearing me this morning? David is fighting the enemy and when he returns from battle sometimes we read the word of God like it's some children's story. But I've never seen a man return from battle without bearing the scars of war. See, my friend, don't always think that victory is pretty. Sometimes it will cost you to win. I know people that have won a battle, but today they still bear the scar because it cost them something. Oh, some of you one day are going to come to me and say, I remember that word. See, sometimes to win, you might have won, but you're wounded. I've sat with great preachers that had great moves of God, but deep down in their hearts today, I felt a bitterness because it cost them too much. It wasn't God's fault, but they allowed those that they had to fight, those that they must resist, cost them a price. David returns from war, blood soaked. Are you getting something out of this? I'm preaching to myself anyway, so... when he comes home I can imagine as they came out of that battlefield they'd won a battle the enemy had died they're riding home into the arms of their wives and their children there was going to be celebration there would be praise there would be the comfort of a wife's loving arms and yet when they arrive home the place where they sought comfort was now a place of conflict. Yeah. 
See, my friend, I want to tell you a truth. And you better listen to me right now in Jesus' name. There are times in our lives that we go and fight and we fight and we fight to win. But sometimes we came home to Ziklag to find that the enemy stole something while we were focusing on a battle. That warrior lost his children, his wife. Have you ever come to a place where you seek comfort but all you ever find is conflict? You see, Ziklag is a place while you're fighting a battle on this side, you didn't realize that the enemy was attacking you on this place. I've been in places in my life, and I'm only young. I don't know much, but I've been in places in my life where I thought I was trying to fight a battle. I thought I was trying to put a fire out. And what I didn't realize is while I was trying to kill that demon, while I was trying to end that attack, another fire had started right in a place that I thought was comfortable. While you were serving God, while you were living the dream, you didn't realize, but your son had picked up a habit that the devil was stealing them from under your nose. Have you ever been to a Ziklag? See, my friend, you thought you'd survived your marriage. You thought... Well, my son's in church. I'm okay. But what you didn't realize is, is that when you thought that fire had gone out, you turned and found that the entire enemy was pressing you in on every side. You see, the Amalekites were a dangerous enemy. In fact, they were one of the most feared enemies of Israel. I'll tell you why. Because the Amalekites were known, they never attacked your strength. They always attacked your vulnerability. I can promise you in Jesus' name that when you really start to do something for God, in a place where you're vulnerable will be the place that the devil starts to do his work. Sometimes the devil can attack you in order to distract you because really he's after your vulnerability. Is there anybody out there this morning? I see people that are on fire for God. They're doing something for Jesus. They're winning a battle, but they never guarded their vulnerability. I want to tell you that the devil has taken out multitudes. There are people in here right now that you were equipped for battle. You were going to live your destiny. It was going to be how God said it was going to be. And the devil attacked you in a vulnerable place. And now you're going to give up. God, if I've ever felt the Holy Ghost on me right now, I feel it. When you're vulnerable, the enemy will try to stick the final knife because he wants you to give up. He wants you to lay down the sword, lay down the armor, and give up right there and then. I was sent here this morning to tell somebody I'm sending a notice out to hell itself. You say, how do you do that? I'm going to speak it right now in the realms of the spirit. Hell, you better get ready. Because the Lord spoke to me that there are people in this house today that are about to make a comeback in Jesus' mighty name. 
Somebody shout hallelujah. You see, exceptional destiny will always call for exceptional testing. If you're exceptionally gifted, exceptionally blessed, get ready for exceptional testing, exceptional attack. You see, you'll find that when God has put a word over your life, your highs will be very high, but better know this, your lows will be very low. The higher the highs, the lower the low. I hope my family don't mind me saying this. But there was a time that I was about to take a crusade. It was going to be huge. It was huge. One of the greatest salvations over 30 to nearly 40,000 souls. But two weeks before, my mother fell ill. It was as if she just shut down. She was so tired. And the decision in my heart was this. What do I do? While I was going to fight the battle in Ziklag, my mom has just been taken out. You see, you'll never know what it is to truly hang on to God until you're in a place where you're caught in the middle. You'll always find when you're in those places that the closest to you will give you advice that's not the advice of God. God is calling you, get ready for war. I will bring you through. It was only when I decided in my heart I'm going and the more you attack my mother, the more I'm going to preach the gospel and I'm going to see multitudes saved. So devil, you better get ready. You say, who are you to say that? Greater is he that is in me than he that would stand against the word of the Lord. My God, somebody shout hallelujah. That's why Paul said, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. I'm here to tell somebody, it's time to get up in Jesus' name. Get up. My God, somebody give Jesus some praise right now. Give him praise. Oh, it's about to get good. You know, last night I, I sat in the room, I began to cry. Because I, I thought about if a day I came home and someone had taken my wife. I was on the mission field preaching the gospel. And you come home and someone's stolen your wife. When you thought you were winning a battle for the Lord. Your home came under attack. For the first time, you see David. The men that fought with him had taken scars for him, had shed blood for him. Now I wanted to kill him.
There are battles I've been in with people. There are fights that people have seen me at my weakest and seen me at my strongest. And I thought they would forever battle with me. But in a time where we were in a fight, I didn't realize that they were tired. And they got took out. You see, in the depths of despair, David is going to quit. There's no fight left in him. See, my friend, take off the mask. Take off the facade. God can't deal with you while ever you pretend. It's okay to say to God, God, I'm tired. There is no fight in me. See, I read something. David, in the depths of despair, goes to God. I can imagine in his heart, he was so tired, and yet there was turmoil. And the Bible says something that changed my heart last night. The Bible says that in that moment, David encouraged himself in the Lord. Have you ever been in a place where nobody knows what's really happening and you have to encourage yourself in the Lord. People don't know what it is anymore to stand alone with God and encourage yourself stirring up that which God has placed within you. That's why the Bible says in Jude, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Shakabo renda la mando, how sopranda la mande. You say, where's the interpretation? I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to God. Encourage yourself. Encourage yourself. Shikaro basandelemo, Haron dashika, out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Somebody needs to give God some praise right about now. Shilaba sondelemo, Haro sakalama. Shilamo sandalamo sa. Come on, encourage yourself. Pray in the Holy Ghost. When we don't know what to pray, when we're so tired, the Bible says the Spirit of God makes intercession on your behalf. Shikarobosa, it's time to come back. A few more seconds, let it go right now, let it go. Every eye on Jesus right now. Yo, 
Your son may have been stolen. Your daughter may be under attack. Your wife, your husband, stir it up. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Jesus! You're going to come out this morning in Jesus' mighty name, renewed in the Holy Ghost. God is calling your name right now. Get up, get up, get up. She can almost send out a Monday. Somebody give a shout of praise. Give a shout of praise. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Those at home, be awakened right now in Jesus' mighty name. <laughs> my God, my God, my God. Father, that which pierced them, that arrow which pierced them, we pull it out right now in Jesus' name. Be awakened. Rise up. <laughs> sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. I'm going to get finished. I know the power of God wants to move. See, the Bible says that the Lord, the Lord said to David, pursue them, overtake them, and you will recover all. David goes out to fight. And the thing was is, as he went to fight, 200 of his men fall in their weariness. You'll always know those that really have the Holy Ghost. You want to talk about anointing? Talk about men that have been through some stuff. That when people were against them, they learned out of the intimacy with the Spirit of God that they encourage themselves. I can't tell you how profound that is. I can't tell you what it is to know that when the going gets tough, when it's time to stop fighting and start to let the Lord rise up in you, lay it before him and begin to encourage yourself speak over yourself the words that god has declared because the devil will tell you about today god speaks about your tomorrow you're gonna live another day you're gonna fight again See, weariness will get you in the end. But if you would learn in the Holy Ghost to use the weapons of your warfare, when you feel like that dream, that destiny is dying, when you feel like you're in zigzag and there's so many wars, you don't have enough people to fight, I want to tell you right now, I ain't just quoting scripture, but you better hold on, hold on. The battle belongs. The battle belongs to the Lord.
No, God gave me a scripture that is just alive in my spirit right now. I might even preach it in California. I don't know. But the Bible says in Ephesians, having done all to stand. I felt that right there. Having done all to stand. Stand therefore with your loins girded with truth. There's no option to die. God says you're going to live. Stand, stand therefore, rise up. The truth is, you ain't gonna die. The truth is, you ain't gonna lose your mind. The truth is, your children will serve the Lord. Guard yourself. Surround yourself with truth. Masuka Randelabo Sandalaba. Woo! Tell hell I ain't coming. In Jesus' name, I ain't giving up. Sit down, sit down. Something great's coming. It's like a fire in my bones right now. I feel the fire of God falling. Something is stirring right now. Some of you may say, what's going on? You'll find out if you stay here long enough. Because my God is the comeback king. When the devil thought he was in the grave. When he thought he was over. The one who is the head of our church. The one who is the king. He showed them what a true comeback was. Up from the grave. He arose. You better get ready because if you mess with you, he messes with him. My God, we love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. I'm telling you, I feel like the power of God's just rolling in here. Whoa. <laughs> That's the power of God. You see, I get really wound up with these preachers that are trying to give you eight steps of how to recover all. They do it on healing. They do it on recovery. What? When you got the power of God in your life and you start living what God has purposed you to live, let me tell you what happens. You don't just recover all. But when David was in Ziklag, he not only recovered Abigail, Abigail means joy. He recovered his joy by going after that which God purposed him to do. And let me tell you what happens. The Bible says that his true destiny was to be king over all of Israel. And while he's in Ziklag with attacks from every side, guess what God did? He didn't take David to the crown. He brought the crown to David. You say, what are you talking about? The Bible says that while he recovered all, 
Two days later, Saul falls on his sword. And an Amalekite servant, in other words, the one that tried to steal from him, was now the one that brought him the crown of Saul. David was king of Israel. I don't know who I'm speaking to. I don't know who I'm preaching to. But you think it's over? You better get ready. Because all you got to do is hold on. All you got to do is fight. All you got to do is let God do what he needs to do. You just hold on to his word. You just encourage yourself in the Lord. Because the crown is on its way. If you believe it, shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. You might have thought you failed God. You might have thought there's no way back. But I'm telling you right now, while ever there's breath in your body, you're going to make a comeback. I'm telling you in Jesus' name. I'm not asking you, I'm telling you. Because God doesn't give you an option. He tells you when you've done all to stand, stand anyway. Because I will be your strength. Can I go on? Is it two o'clock yet? Am I in trouble? My greatest, one of my great hurts is when I see Christians living in a place they were never made to be. And the greatest tragedy of revival is that many times preachers come into what is the glory of God and they preach any old spout. Thank God for Steve Hill. Thank God for Pastor Kilpatrick. Because I've heard some trash sometimes. And they're binding people up. They're trying to do this, that, and the other. They're trying to do this, do all this stuff. And what they're doing is driving themselves into the floor. And today they're not even in the kingdom. And I'm telling you right now, it is not by might, it is not by power. In other words, all you think you've got does not work. But it is by my spirit, says the Lord. I'm going to close in a second because I feel the power of God's about to hit this place. I saw something last night that just blessed me. David met his destiny in the greatest place of opposition. And in the generation of Joshua, Ziklag had been conquered and given over to Judah. You say, what is the significance of that? Is the very thing that battled, the very thing that the enemy tried to stop the king of Israel that would bring Christ. He knew if he stopped David, he stopped the line of God's will. But in that moment, when when Ziklag rose as opposition, eventually God gave it back to praise. You see, Judah means praise. I want to tell you that in a place of opposition will be your greatest place of praise. 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 Where the devil thought he had you will be the place of your greatest praise. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. I said you ought to shout hallelujah. Rebecca, come right now quickly. Quickly, let's go, let's go. Just begin to praise him right now. You know, there's so much that I wanted to go into this morning, but I I just don't have the time. Enough's been said that the power of God's here. He knows what to do.
play, Rebecca, really play, really play, begin to worship. Praise must resound in this place right now. Is there anybody in opposition this morning? See, I know God's word has a way of reaching every situation. I don't know what it was, but last night, I said to the guys this morning, the urgency in my heart was don't quit. Don't quit. Stand still. And see the stars. We pray that this message will help you be never the same again. For more information, for more of our latest resources, you can visit us at shakethenations.com. We hope to hear from you. God bless you.